Okay. I'm live. I'm starting a new series. I'm excited about this because uh, I'm going to be reading a book, one of my favorite books on Catholic dogma. It's Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Ludwig Ott, Dr. Ludwig Ott. A one-volume encyclopedia of the doctrines of the Catholic Church showing their sources in scripture and tradition and their definitions by popes and councils. So I'll be going through this. The way I read books is I start at the end. I start at the back of the book. So at the back of the book, this book by Dr. Ludwig Ott is a conspectus of all dogmatic theology and quite the most remarkable work of compression of its kind that I have encountered. The book will appeal particularly to busy priests who are anxious to review quickly the teachings from tradition, from the Bible, and from reason on any particular point of doctrine. It will be specially useful to students, and it makes available for educated laymen a scientific exposition of the whole field of Catholic teaching. Finally, Dr. Ott's work will be invaluable for use as a textbook by those priests whose duty it is to present to students in a systematic way the teachings of the Catholic Church. This taken from the foreword by James Cannon Bastable, DD, Doctor of Divinity, I guess that is. This is a tan book. Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. This episode zero is an introduction. I have started on the back page. Now I'm going to just go and take a look at the very last page and I'll go backwards until I get to the end of the main body of text. I started reading this. Uh, I read it first. I first read it in 2010, which is shortly after my conversion. And here I have a little drawing illustration I did of the Trinity, Patris Filius, Spiritus Sanctus. Yeah, I've got the P, F, and S for the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we've got in one God, we have two generations, three persons, four relations, and we see the asymmetry in these relations here between the passive and the active generation, intellectual generation, and the passive and active spiration. Spiration is volitional of the will. Generation is intellectual of the reason. Okay. PF does not become a fourth person by being the subject of active spiration. So if you group together the father and the son, who together spirate the Holy Spirit, the third person, that does not mean that the father and the son become a fourth person person. Okay. So we see, I'm just going to quickly go through these, intro, these indices at the back. We can see references to the texts of the Old and New Testaments. Very useful index. I recommend you get a copy of this book. I haven't found it in uh, Kindle format, ebook format, or PDF or anything like that, so I just went ahead and bought the book back in 2010. So the index, this particular index is the index to the Old New Testament. It gives the credits there. Very exhaustive index. We also have an index of subjects. Very thorough index. Okay, the index of subjects. And then we have, going backwards of course, we have the index of persons. So, very thorough once again. St. Ignatius of Antioch there, you can see 
I'll just skip ahead or backwards. Then we have the uh, corrections. So the index of persons there, excluding authors and literary references. So the uh, next page going backwards is the errata or corrigenda. And I've gone through and I've actually applied all of those with my little pencil. Now we have the bibliography, quite a thorough bibliography with headings, topics, okay. The bibliography is very good. And here I just put a little cross at the end of the final chapter. And so as a little spoiler alert, I'll just read this final chapter of the book. The end of the world and its renewal brings to a conclusion the work of Christ. As all enemies of the kingdom of God are conquered, he surrenders the overlordship to God the Father. Without, however, divesting himself of the lordship and royal power founded in the hypostatic union. With the end of the world, there begins the perfect lordship of God, which is the ultimate object of the whole creation and the final meaning of all human history. So, a little spoiler alert, the spiritual battle is already determined, it's already won. God wins in the end. I do this when I read fiction too, I go to the very end and I read the uh, last page or so just to see how things end up. That's just the way I do it. So I'm going to now go to the beginning of the book, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, edited in English by James Cannon, Bastable, DD, translated from the German by Patrick Lynch, Lynch PhD, Tan Books and Publishers Incorporated, Rockford, Illinois, and uh, put my name and the date when I started reading it. I also have a little note here, difficult concepts have an exclamation point. I don't know how many of those we'll discover we go through, because it's been quite a while since I've gone through this book. This, this book was first published in English in May 1955 by the Mercier Press Limited. First published in German in 1952 under the title Grundriss der Katholischen Dogmatic by Verlag Herder. And uh, this is the fourth edition that I own, published in May 1960. Always good to see the Nihil Obstat and the Imprimatur. So we have uh, for the Nihil Obstat, we have Jeremiah J. O'Sullivan. And for the Imprimatur, we have Bishop Cornelius sure what the Latin is there that follows his name. So these were granted on the 7th of October 1954. Printed and bound in the United States of America, tan books, etc. Now we see 1974. So I'm going to read the entire book because I'm going to use it later in an edited audio form as sort of uh, audiobook for myself, just to brush up on all the concepts that are contained in this wonderful book. So as part of the introduction, I'll read the preface. preface. This basic course of dogmatic theology appears in place of B. Bartman's 1938 basic course, which has been out of print for years. Derived from practical experience of theological instruction, it is primarily intended to meet the needs of students. My aim was to present the essentials of the church teaching and the foundation of such teaching in clear and concise form. On didactic grounds, the matter was very extensively correlated. As the framework of a basic course could not be exceeded, only the most important pronouncements of official church teaching only individual significant scriptural texts, and only one or two patristic texts could be quoted verbatim. 
The history of the development of dogma has been kept within the minimum limits indispensable for the understanding of church doctrine. The scriptural and patristic texts were, on principle, quoted in their translation. Anyone desirous of seeing the original texts can easily find them in the Bible. Most of the patristic texts quoted or indicated may be found in the Enchiridion Patristicum of M. J. Rouet de Journel, 1947. On account of the brevity aimed at, the speculative establishment of doctrine had to give place to the positive. The many indications of the works of St. Thomas are intended to be a pointer to deeper study. The reader is directed to the appropriate articles in the Dictionnaire de Théologie Catholique and to the Theologische Wörterbuch zum Neuen Testament of G. Kittel, excuse my pronunciation in foreign languages. The present basic course is constructed on the framework of the lectures of my teacher, Michael Rackel, who died in 1948 as Bishop of Eichstatt, Eichstatt, and of Martin Grubman, who died in 1949, and I venture to hope that it breathes of their spirit. It was, Grabman, it was Grabman who urged me to publish this work. I acknowledge with thanks that I found many hints and ideas in various religious textbooks, particularly those of Bartman, Dijkamp, Pohl, and Van Noort. I am indebted to the Most Reverend Dr. Alfred Kempf in Oberzell by Würzburg for assistance in reading proofs and for the preparation of the Index of Persons. May this book contribute to the extension of the knowledge of the Church's teaching, to the deepening of the understanding of this teaching, and to the awakening of the religious life. Eichstadt, 15th of August, 1952. Ludwig Ott. Next, we have the foreword to the English edition, the first English edition. This book by Dr. Ludwig Ott is a conspectus of all dogmatic theology and quite the most remarkable work of compression of its kind that I have encountered. The book will appeal particularly to busy priests who are anxious to review quickly the teaching from tradition, from the Bible, and from reason on any particular point of doctrine. It will be specially useful to students who desire to revise rapidly in the vernacular the tracts which they are presenting for examination. It makes available for educated laymen a scientific exposition of the whole field of Catholic teaching. Finally, Dr. Ott's work will be invaluable for use as a textbook by those priests whose duty it is to present to students in a systematic way the teaching of the Catholic Church. The Mercier Press has performed a service of major importance in making this work available in English. A special word of praise is due to the translator, Dr. Patrick Lynch, whose careful and accurate work made my task relatively simple. Personally, I am happy to be associated with the first appearance in English of this work. I believe it will prove to be of such importance and lasting value as to justify fully the labor which has gone into its production. James Bastable, University, University College, Cork, which I believe is in Ireland. A little sip of water before I read the foreword here. Forward to the second English edition. The exhaustion of the first edition in such short time is most gratifying. It may perhaps be interpreted not only as an indication of the need which the book fills, but also as a tribute to the book itself. In this connection, it is of considerable interest to note that Dr. Ott's work has appealed not only to priests and religious, but to a very wide circle of lay folk. As the author mentions in his preface, the object is to provide a basic course. In the light of this book, is <clears throat> in the light of this book is amazingly comprehensive. Oh, excuse me. In the light of this, the book is amazingly comprehensive. The references to disputed questions are, of course, very much in outline, but students of theology find them valuable in that they recall to their minds problems which they have studied in detail elsewhere. 
The very many references to sources and the bibliography will appeal to those desiring to study particular points more fully than they are dealt with here. This second English edition embodies the many changes made in the second and third German editions. Further, in this edition, all Latin quotations have been translated wherever this seemed necessary to enable a reader whose Latin is rusty to follow the text with ease. I don't speak Latin. Every effort has been made to eliminate inaccuracies, but doubtless some slips have been overlooked in this book with its quarter million words. I shall be very grateful for any help by readers in correcting these in future editions. James Bastable, University College, Cork. Here we have a list of abbreviations. I will not read them, but they're on the screen if you want to pause and read those. Now, on to something I find exciting in every book I read, the table of contents. Without giving the page numbers, I'll just briefly run through this. We have the preface, the forewords, which I've read, and abbreviations, which I have not read, but which you can pause and look at for yourself. Introduction. Under the heading of introduction, we have concept and object of theology. Theology as a science. Concept and method of dogmatic theology. Concept and classification of dogma. The developments of dogma. Catholic truths. Theological opinions, theological grades of certainty, theological censors. So much for the introduction. Then we have Book 1, The Unity and Trinity of God. Part 1, The Unity of God, His Existence and Nature. Section 1, The Existence of God. Chapter 1, The Natural Knowability of the Existence of God. The possibility of the natural knowledge of God in the light of supernatural revelation. The possibility of a proof of God's existence. Errors regarding the natural knowability of God. I put a little arrow next to that. I must have found that interesting. Chapter 2. The supernatural knowability of the existence of God. God's existence as an object of faith. Section 2. The Nature of God. Chapter 1. The Knowledge of the Nature of God. The natural knowledge of the nature of God in this world. The supernatural knowledge of the divine essence in the other world. The supernatural knowledge of the divine being in this world through faith. Chapter 2. The Nature of God in, in itself. The Biblical Names of God. The Physical and Metaphysical Nature of God. Section 3, the attributes or qualities of God. The attributes of God in general. Chapter 1, the attributes of the divine being. The absolute perfection of God. God's infinity. God's simplicity. God's unicity. God's truth. God's goodness. God's immutability. God's eternity. The immensity or immeasurability of God and his omnipresence. Chapter 2. The attributes of the divine life. The divine knowledge or knowing. The perfection of divine knowledge. Object and division of the divine knowing. The medium of the divine prescience of free actions of rational creatures. The divine knowing as origin of things the divine willing, the perfection of the divine willing, the object of the divine volition, the physical properties of the divine will, the moral attributes of the divine will. Part 2, the doctrine of the triune God. Section 1, dogmatic formulation and positive foundation of the dogma of the Trinity. Chapter 1. The Anti-Trinitarian Heresies and the Doctrinal Decisions of the Church. The Heresies. The Doctrinal Decisions of the Church. Chapter 2. Proof of the Existence of the Trinity from Scripture and Tradition. Indications of the Trinity of God in the Old Testament. 
the Trinitarian formulae, the New Testament doctrine of God the Father, God the Son, the New T Testament teaching concerning God the Holy Ghost, the New Testament doctrine of the numerical unity of the divine nature in the three persons, the testimony of tradition for the Trinity of God. Chapter 3, Triple Personality of God, the Triple Personality of God, the internal divine processions in general, the procession of the Son from the Father by way of generation, the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and the Son by way of spiration. Section 2, Speculative Explanation of the Dogma of the Trinity. Chapter 1. Speculative Explanation of the Internal Divine Processions. The Son proceeds from the intellect of the Father by way of generation. The Holy Ghost proceeds from the will or from the mutual love of the Father and of the Son. The Holy Ghost does not proceed through generation, but through spiration. Chapter 2. The Divine Relations and Persons. The divine relations, the divine persons, the divine personal properties and notions, the Trinitarian perichoresis, circum, circum in session, the unity of the divine operation ad extra, the appropriations, what I call condescension, the divine missions. Chapter 3, the relation of the Trinity to reason. The Mysterious Character of the Dogma of the Trinity. Continuing with the Table of Contents, Book 2, God the Creator. Section 1, The Divine Act of Creation. Chapter 1, The Beginning of the World or the Creation of the World. The Reality of the Divine Creation of the World. The Divine World Idea. Motive and purpose of the creation of the world. The Trinity and creation. Freedom of the divine act of creation. The temporal character of the world. Incommunicability of the creative power. Chapter 2. The continuous preservation and governing of the world. The preservation of the world. The divine cooperation. The divine providence and government of the world. Section 2, The Divine Work of Creation. Chapter 1, Revealed Doctrine Concerning Material Things, i.e. Christian Cosmology. The Biblical Hexameron. Hexahameron. Six Days of Creation. The Doctrine of Evolution in the Light of Revelation. That will be interesting to look at. The Doctrine of the Revelation Regarding Man or Christian Anthropology The Nature of Man, the Origin of the First Human Pair, and the Unity of the Human Race The Essential Constituent Parts of Human Nature The Origin of the Individual Human Souls The Elevation of Man to the Supernatural Order The Concept of the Supernatural The Relation Between Nature and Supernature The supernatural endowment of the first man. The various states of human nature. 3. Man's lapse from the supernatural order. The personal sin of the first parents or original sin. The existence of original sin. The nature of original sin. The transmission of original sin. The consequences of original sin. The lot of children dying in original sin. Chapter 3, Revelation Concerning the Angels, or Christian Angelology. Existence, origin, and number of the angels. The nature of the angels. The supernatural exaltation and probation of the angels. The fall through sin and the rejection of the bad angels. The efficacy of the good angels. The efficacy of the bad angels. Continuing with the Table of Contents, Book 3, The Doctrine of God the Redeemer, Part 1, The Doctrine of the Person of the Redeemer, Preliminary Examination, The Historical Existence of Jesus Christ, Section 1, The Two Natures in Christ and the Mode and Manner of Their Unification, Chapter 1, The True Divinity of Christ, 
the dogma of the true divinity of Christ and its opponents, the testimony of the Old Testament, the testimony of the Synoptic Gospels, of the Gospel of St. John, of the Pauline Epistles, the testimony from the tradition of the Church. Chapter 2, Christ's true humanity, the reality of Christ's true human nature. Christ's human nature, the integrity of Christ's human nature, the Adamite origin of Christ's human nature. Chapter 3, the unification of the two natures in Christ in the unity of the person. The unity of Christ's person, the duality of the natures, the duality of the willing and the modes of operation. Beginning and duration of the hypostatic union. Chapter 4, Theological Speculative Discussion on the Hypostatic Union. The Supernatural and Mysterious Character of the Hypostatic Union. Objections Against the Dogma of the Hypostatic Union. The Relationship of the Hypostatic Union to the Trinity. <clears throat> Chapter 5, Inferences from the Hypostatic Union. The Natural Sonship of God of the Man Jesus Christ. Christ's right to adoration, the adoration of the most sacred heart of Jesus, communication of idioms, the Christological perichoresis. Section 2, the attributes of Christ's human nature, chapter 1, the prerogatives of Christ's human nature, the prerogative of Christ in the domain of human knowledge, the immediate vision of God, the infused knowledge of Christ. Christ's acquired knowledge and the progress of his human knowledge, the excellences of Christ's human will or Christ's holiness, Christ's sinlessness and impeccability, Christ's sanctity and fullness of grace, the perfection of Christ's human power, Christ's power. Chapter 2, the defects or the passibility of Christ's human nature, Christ's capacity for suffering, Part 2, the doctrine of the work of the Redeemer. Chapter 1, the redemption in general. The purpose of the incarnation. The controversy as to the conditioned or unconditioned predestination of the incarnation. Concept and possibility of the redemption through Christ. Necessity for and freedom of the redemption. Chapter 2, the realization of the redemption through the three offices of Christ. The teaching office, Christ's teaching or prophetic, prophetical office. The pastoral office, Christ's pastoral or kingly office. The priestly office, the reality of Christ's priestly office. The exercise of the sac sacerdotal office or Christ's sacrifice. The, seriotolog the soteriological importance of Christ's sacrifice, Christ's vicarious atonement, Christ's merits. Chapter 3, the glorious conclusion of Christ's work of redemption, Christ's descent into hell, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven. Part 3, the mother of the Redeemer. Chapter 1, Mary's motherhood of God. The reality of Mary's motherhood of God, Mary's fullness of grace and her divinity, or her, excuse me, her dignity deriving from her motherhood of God. Mary is not divine. That was a slip of the tongue. Chapter 2, the privileges of the mother of God, Mary's immaculate conception, Mary's freedom from evil concup concupiscence and from every personal sin, her perpetual virginity, the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. Chapter 3, Mary's cooperation in the work of redemption, the mediatorship of Mary, the veneration of Mary. Book 4, the doctrine of God the sanctifier, part 1, the doctrine of grace, introduction of grace in general, the subjective redemption in general, the concept of grace, the classification of grace, the principal errors concerning grace. Section 1, actual grace. Chapter 1, the nature of actual grace. Enlightening and strengthening grace. Antecedent and consequent grace. Controversy as to the nature of actual grace. Chapter 2. The necessity of actual grace. 
the necessity of grace for the acts of the supernatural order, human nature's capacity to act without grace, and the limits of this capacity. <clears throat> Chapter 3, the distribution of actual grace. God's freedom in the distribution of grace, or the gratuity of grace. The universality of grace. The mystery of predestination. The mystery of reprobation. Chapter 4, the relation between grace and freedom. The, church, the teaching of the church on grace and freedom as against heresy. Theological speculation on the re relationship between grace and freedom. Chapter 2, the efficacy and the effects of the sacraments. I jumped a page. So, just to recap, I said theolog theological speculations on the relationship between grace and freedom. Continuing, section 2, habitual grace. Chapter 1, the process of justification. The concept of justification, the causes of justification, the preparation for justification. Chapter 2, the state of justification. The nature of sanctifying grace, the formal effects of sanctifying grace, the comity of sanctifying grace. It's not comedy, but comity. The attributes of the state of grace. Chapter 3, the consequences or fruits of justification or the doctrine concerning merit. <clears throat> Excuse me. The reality of supernatural merit, <clears throat> the conditions of supernatural merit, the object of supernatural merit. Continuing with the table of contents, part two, the church, chapter one, the divine origin of the church, the concept of the church, the foundation of the church by Christ, the purpose of the church. Chapter two, the constitution of the church. The hierarchical constitution of the church. The primacy of St. Peter. Primacy of jurisdiction of the Pope. The nature of the papal primacy. The papal teaching primacy or the papal infallibility and the bishops chapter three the internal constitution of the church christ and the church the holy ghost and the church chapter four the properties or essential attributes of the church the indefectibility of the church the infallibility of the church the visibility of the church the unity of the church the sanctity of the church the catholicity of the church the apostolicity of the church. Chapter 5, the necessity of the church, membership of the church, the necessity for membership of the church. Chapter 6, the communion of saints, concept and reality of the communion of saints, the communion of the faithful living on earth, the communion between the faithful on earth and the saints in heaven, the communion of the faithful on earth and the saints in heaven with the poor souls in purg purgatory. And part three, the sacraments. Now, that's where I accidentally turned the page when I should have earlier. Now we're coming to this, the sacraments. Section one, the doctrine of the sacraments in general. Chapter one, the nature of the sacraments. The concept of the sacrament. The constituent parts of the sacramental sign. Chapter two, the efficacy and effects of the sacraments. The objective efficacy of the sacraments, the mode of operation of the sacraments, the effects of the sacraments. Chapter 3, the institution and the sevenfold nature of the sacraments. The institution of the sacraments by Christ, the seven sacraments, the necessity of the sacraments. Chapter 4, the minister and the recipient of the sacraments. The minister of the sacraments, the recipient of the sacraments. Chapter 5, the pre-Christian sacraments and sacramentals, the pre-Christian sacraments, the sacramentals. Section two, the seven sacraments. Part one, the sacrament of baptism, 
the concept of baptism and its sacramental nature, the outward sign of baptism, effects of baptism, necessity of baptism, minister of baptism, recipient of baptism, the sacrament, part two, the sacrament of confirmation, concept of confirmation and its sacramental nature, the outward sign of confirmation, the effects of confirmation, the necessity of confirmation, the minister of confirmation, and the recipient of confirmation. The sacrament of the Eucharist. The concept of the Eucharist. Section 1. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Chapter 1. The fact of the real presence of Christ. <clears throat> the heretical counter-thesis. Theses. Christ's real presence according to the testimony of Holy Scripture. The real presence according to the testimony of tradition. Chapter 2, the effecting of Christ's real presence, or the transubstantiation. Dogma and concept of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation according to the testimony of the sources of faith. The sacramental accidents. Chapter 3, nature and manner of the real presence of Christ. The totality of the presence. The permanence of the real presence. The adoration due to the Eucharist. Chapter 4, The Blessed Eucharist and Human Reason, The Mysterious Character of the Eucharist, Apparent Contradictions Between Reason and the Eucharistic Dogma. Section 2, The Eucharist as a Sacrament, The Sacramental Nature of the Eucharist, The Outward Signs of the Eucharist, The Effects of the Eucharist, The Necessity of the Eucharist, The Minister of the Eucharist, The Recipient of the Eucharist. Section 3, the Eucharist as a sacrifice. Chapter 1, the reality of the sacrifice of the Mass. The sacrificial character of the Eucharist according to the teaching of the Church. The, sacrament, the, the sacrificial character of the Eucharist according to the testimony of the Holy Writ. The sacrificial character of the Eucharist according to the testimony of tradition. Chapter 2, the nature of the sacrifice of the Mass, the relation of the sacrifice of the Mass to the sacrifice of the cross, the physical nature of the sacrifice of the Mass, the metaphysical nature of the sacrifice of the Mass. Chapter 3, the effects and efficacy of the sacrifice of the Mass, the effects of the sacrifice of the Mass, the efficacy of the sacrifice of the Mass, the value and the fruits of the sacrifice of the Mass. 4, the sacrament of penance, the concept of penance. Section 1, the Church's power to forgive sins. Chapter 1, the existence of the Church's power to forgive sins. The dogma and the heretical counter-propositions. The testimony of Holy Writ. The testimony of tradition. Chapter 2, the property, properties of the Church's power to forgive sins. The Church's power to forgive sins as a true power of absolution. The universality of the Church's power to forgive sins. The, ju the judicial character of the Church's power to forgive sins. Section 2, the Church's forgiveness of sins as a sacrament, the sacramental nature of the Church's forgiveness of sins. Chapter 1, the outward signs of the sacrament of penance. Contrition, contrition in general, perfect contrition, imperfect contrition. Confession, the divine institution of confession and the necessity of confession for salvation. The object of confession. Satisfaction, concept and quality of sacramental satisfaction. Absolution, the priest's absolution as a form of the sacramental pe sacrament of penance. Chapter 2, the effects of the sacrament of penance and its necessity. The effects of the sacrament of penance, the necessity of the sacrament of penance. Chapter 3, the minister and the recipient of the sacrament of penance. The minister of the sacrament of penance, the recipient of the sacrament of penance. Almost done the table of contents here. I know it's it may seem dry to some, but I love seeing the bird's eye view, the overview of what we're going to get into here. Continuing with the table of contents. Now, what's happening? Did I miss something? It seems to be jumping to the appendix. The doctrine of indulgences. Okay, maybe there's an appendix for that last part that I read.
the last thing I read was number 19, the recipient of the sacrament of penance. And then the next thing is 20, the doctrine of indulgences. That little word appendix there, I'm not sure why that's there, but anyway, I'll just continue. Five, the sacrament of extreme unction. The comprom the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, concept and sacramental nature of extreme unction. The outward signs of extreme unction, the effects of extreme unction, the necessity of extreme unction, the minister of extreme unction, the recipient of extreme unction. Six, the sacrament of holy order. Excuse me, the concept and sacramental nature of holy order. I call it holy orders, but they call it holy order. The individual grades of ordination, the outward sign of the sacrament of order, the effects of the sacrament of order, the dispenser of the sacrament of order, the receiver of the sacrament of order. Seven, the sacrament of matrimony, concept, origin, and sacramental nature of matrimony, purpose and properties of matrimony. The outward sign of the sacrament of matrimony. The effects of the sacrament of matrimony, minister and recipient of the sacrament of matrimony, the church's power over matrimony. Book five, the doctrine of God, the consummator, the doctrine of the last things or of the consummation, eschatology. Chapter one, the eschatology of the individual human being, death, the particular judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory. Chapter two, the eschatology of the whole of humanity, the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the general judgment, the end of the world. And then, of course, we have the bibliography, the index of persons, and the index of subjects, which I walked you through very briefly by way of introduction. Speaking of introductions, here is the introduction, the official introduction of the book, which I will read to you now. Concept and object of theology. Concept, the word theology, according to its etymology, means teaching concerning God. Logos peri theu. De divinitate ratio sive sermo, St. Augustine, so it's so God. Thus theology is the science of God. I'm going to leave it off here now. I've done 42 minutes. I think this is a good place to start, actually, the next installment. So I will leave it there. Because if we look at this introduction section that I just started reading, it actually has a quite a lot of meat, meaty stuff. So I'd like to come back and do that as a separate video. So we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And uh, I might do part one a little bit later today, or I might do it uh, next weekend. We'll see how it goes. But uh, anyway, thanks for being there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Take care. We'll talk soon. God bless.